Okay, so now everyone. So few of us say you just for me to start with the camera, we're just gonna have a run table. And this is actually gonna be a talk that's a bit aimed like that because I don't really know what this talk is about. Like I, I don't really but but the, the thing that it is about is is I think quite neat and, and relevant to, to Hackware and also very recent. Like this all happened in the last couple of weeks. And by the time we just talk a bit about that. So I want to talk about the home lab too, which is a computer. And I want to talk about some games that I made for the home lab, why I made them and why this might be interesting. So the home lab two is a computer. So, okay, so the story goes like this. In 1981, there were a pair of brothers back in Hungary who wanted to make a Hungarian version of the home group computing club. So they basically started building their own computer in their kitchen. And the home lab one was destroyed, like, or like cannibalized. Like they, they made a prototype, they didn't like it, and then it was destroyed. Uh, and then they used the parts to build home lab two in 1982. And it was an interesting machine in some sense. And also, but in other sense, it was also very similar to other machines of its type. So it's a Z80 based uh, home computer. Okay, so does everyone even know what a home computer is? Like the category of you know, okay, so okay, so home computer was basically like before PCs, like in the late 70s, early 80s, home computer would be something that like you would buy for home, and it would be a computer that's like low cost, much, much lower cost than the other kinds of computers of the time. And it would come in usually it would come in the form of a keyboard. So, so the keyboard is a computer, and you plug it usually into your TV, so you have to find a separate uh, screen. And usually it would go to basic. So programming and using the machine was one and the same. So, so this was based on this same idea. Uh, it uses a Z80 CPU, which was a 8-bit CPU from Zilog. It basically, you could say it's two Intel 8080s like grouped together, or like the register files of two 8080s grouped together. And it had eight kilobytes of ROM, 16 kilobytes of RAM, plus an extra one kilobyte of dedicated video RAM for, for this uh, character-based graphics. And what is interesting, I think, to this crowd is that other than the CPU and memory, everything else was 7400 series ICs, and a lot of them. So, so like the video signal was generated with 7400 series. The tape, so because it had a cassette tape for, for storing, uh, Persistently storing data that was done with 74 series. Everything was done with 74 series. The reason for that was cost saving, and also because like, there was this thing called Qualcomm that I don't think anyone here in Singapore would have ever heard, but that was an export restriction uh, treaty of the like the Western world or NATO countries, and I think it's even more than just NATO countries. And of course, because Hungary was part of the the other side of history, the wrong side of history. So so. High tech was not allowed to be exported to Hungary. So doing everything with the simplest possible set for uh, 7400 series was, was important. Okay, so so then um, the what I really like about the home left here is how they ended up doing video. So like I said, it has no dedicated video graphics chip. So what they ended up or video signal generator chip. So the CPU itself it is basically bit banking the PAL output, but if you think about you know the, the timing of PAL and the timing of the four megahertz uh, Z80, it just doesn't work out. So what they do is this, instead of running a program that would retrieve data from video memory and then feed back that some output, the CPU jumps into the video memory. So the CPU thinks that it's executing the contents of video memory, but the data bus is hacked so that the CPU sees knobs instead of the contents of the video memory. But there's a character ROM whose address lines are directly connected to the data bus of the video RAM. So this way, the CPU can, as fast as it is possible for a CPU, because the fastest way you can scan some area of memory is if you use the program counter instead of any other register, because if you have any register, then just loading the program to load the instruction that would increment your counter, right? It's already much slower. Whereas if you just execute a knob, then a side effect of executing anything is increasing the program counter. And but but what this means? Oh, and then okay, just because the math, if you think about this, the math still doesn't work out. So the idea is that the you read eight bits 
from the character realm and it's fed into the shift register and that shift register is plot fast enough to shift out the eight bits for the next eight pixels. But that means that while the visible part of the screen is scanned by the CRT, all the CPU is doing is just tracing the beam. So more than 80% CPU time is unusable for your program. So you can that's turn it off. That's not as unusable as Sinclair. That exactly yeah, it has a similar. Not, not, the same. not exactly the same. Yes, not the same. But CPU was overwhelmingly uh, yes. pushing video out and then did everything else. In the region. Yes, and of course you can turn off video output, and then you and can so you have to do to a cassette file. Yes, yes. Oh, and in this one you have to turn off for cassette file, not just for timing purposes, but actually, but because the basically the same address line, like so, one of the address lines of oh. the video. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean in practice it doesn't really matter because you have to turn it off anyway because the, the cassette input is all yeah. done in software so, so so the timings are very important to to, to measure how much time passes between spikes of the like so, so yeah like on the tape you would have like this tiny yeah, there's, there's no like oh yeah that, that too but yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so what is my involvement in this? I've never heard of this computer until a couple of months ago. I, I've never heard of this. No one really shows up this computer. So all that too, I think there was like maximum of 200 of them built, but that, you know, like in kit form, there's no two that are the same, but that's like not true. Like half of them are kit. Half of them was produced by a, some agricultural large government company, whatever. And, we, and I think it's really fun that if you get a subscription library, there's not like this is like 10 programs you can find for this, but one of them is a, a livestock feed optimizer. Like that's one of the, the main programs for them that do. It's like a, a linear programming thing, you know, where you, yeah. I mean, that it's like this is the operation fix with 101 problem that everyone has seen in school, but it's actually used in practice for that. So I've heard of this, but um, there's a Hungarian retro computing and retro gaming podcast, and there they had a an episode about this. And that's how I heard of this. And what was interesting about it is that the the, the, the there was their guest who knew everything about this computer. He was saying, "Oh, and actually, to to promote building software for this and to promote you know people knowing about this because it's such an important piece of." Hungarian computing history because you know like the first and, and the truly Hungarian made designed and built uh, computer that they, they, they are announcing a, like the, the Johan Lyman computer site they announced the game development competition for this machine and when I heard this episode it was just when I was like a week or a couple of days from from going home anyway so I I had like a long week ahead of me. So, and I've never seen a lab too. I've never done any assembly programming. I've never developed for this like the I found some 65 with this stuff like Rust. That's the kind of crazy that I am. So of course I thought, okay, well, of course I'm gonna make a game for it, right? Like, and then I think I had like one and a half months for the whole thing. So how do you do this, right? Like you have this computer, you've never seen it, you can't touch it because you, know, you can't find one, uh, you can't just start working on one. So you need some emulation of it, right? Emulation situation was less than ideal. It, actually, the game development competition also spurred the improvements in that. But when I started looking into this, there was no good emulator story because so MAME had an emulator that was kind of working like you could boot it to basic, but if you wanted to do anything that's like real time, it just wouldn't make it wouldn't cut it because it didn't actually implement the video system. So it was like running the CPU on its own and then rendering the, the, the video memory content on its own. But this whole thing about how the CPU after 15 or something percent of its time gets um, Suspended, so to speak. Oh, and by the way, the, the horizontal retrace is not even the leader. It's really just the vertical retrace. So, so that was not implemented. And then there was a closed source Windows only emulator uh, that was supposed to be better, but I can't really tell if it's better or not because it's a closed source Windows only emulator. So I ended up writing a single page web app uh, emulator, which was a lot of fun because you know, there's not that much documentation for this machine. So a lot of it you have to kind of guess by 
looking at the original documentation. So you read the original 1982 documentation that was in a type of someone's typewriter, and, and, and then it has some like hand-drawn diagrams and stuff. And then, and, but luckily you can find dumps of the, the ROM contents. And then I tried to clean that up and I got to the point where you start this video magic, right? But that was not really documented. And then to figure out, okay, what do I put on the, on the, on the data bus to make everything work? It's not as straightforward. It's not just not because basically you have to end the line somehow. So, so after the right amount of, of reading from this video RAM shadow area, you have to make sure that the next opcode that the CPU is, is actually one of the, the reset of codes of the ZAT, which allows you to jump to a specific address in just one byte. So anyway, so then yes, I wrote this. So obviously for the ZAT4, I could just, just use an open source library. Then I rewrote the Nidris too. I mean, the, the whole web version because Again, I'm that kind of crazy. And then you can imagine that this used up a lot of time. And then, of course, the, the deadline started approaching. So, okay, so what if you haven't really done any games yet? So, how am I going to write the games? Well, kind of as a parody of myself, I decided that I'm going to use a Tesco DSL for the assembler. So, this is like an example of something where you can see like the macroing capabilities that you get for free by being a DSL. So, here, so I don't know what it, but whether like, I don't know how widespread the term is, but in the Commodore 64, there's this thing called speed coding, which is like a fancy word for unrolling loops. Like if you want to do things really fast, then you just you know, make it. And, and this one, it shows you how easy it is to do speed coding if you have a, like a host language. Because here, you know, I and J go for zero to three, and then you just emit assembly code Basically, the 16, so, so you, I mean, this 16 times, and then the address calculation and all that is completely set. You done ahead of time during assembly, and then you just end up with the 16 times for destruction. So it's, it's like big, but it's going to be as fast as it can be. Uh, and then during development, uh, the fastest way of actually trying to things out was to just inject the memory of the machine and then just, just jump there, which is a big benefit of writing your own emulator because you can do tricks like that. Uh, so what did I write? So so I, I wanted to get like some handle on the machine. So the first one I wrote was Snake. Actually, the first one I started writing was Tetris, but then I saw that someone had already done Tetris, and they actually knew what they were doing, unlike me. So I'm like, okay, well, they're, they're, they're making better Tetris than I'm going to make. So let's put that aside. So let's try something even simpler. So then I wrote Snake. Um, you can imagine how it would be. Oh, so, so this is all character graphics. I never implemented raster graphics because it's like quite slow and also that one is even less documented. So, and, and, and yeah, character graphics. And then the second one was a 2048 game, you know, the one where you slide the tiles around. So that it's like everyone has 2048. Um, so these ones were simple, right? Like each of them was think about like less than 2K, the finished game. The first one was real time. Worst snake. And the reason that I went with 2048 for the second game was because I had an occasion to see a real home lab too. There, there was a home lab event. So I went there and the, uh, there was the actual machine, like a small TV. And turns out that so the keyboard situation is really, really bad. Like it's this foil based keyboard and it's really unresponsive and slow. And this also explains why if you try to emulate it, you get input glitches because the firmware, of course, is made with the assumption that the foil is glitching. And so real time is not, like it's very awkward to, to play real time games. And there's nothing else, it's just the keyboard. You don't have joystick, don't have, I don't know, D-pad, nothing. So that's why I went with 2048, because that it's a turn based game, so yeah. Um, but also like, what the thing you can't hear is that it's, it's nicely smoothly animated. So when you, you know, like slide in a certain direction, the, the tiles don't go, Right, like character by character instead of block by block. And it turned out that I, I couldn't make it fast enough to, to finish, like to, to re-render everything in time. So I ended up doing double buffering, which of course technically makes things even slower because you have to copy everything over into the fixed memory, a uh, video memory location, but it avoided flickering. So that was one of the takeaways. Yeah, yeah double buffering. Color. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, so this is one bit. Yeah, so you have like eight bits. So, so you have 64 bits, or so eight bytes for each character in the ROM, and you can't even change that. So the character set is fixed. And then, yeah, it's like eight by eight, one bit. Oh. I mean, yeah, yeah. But you can see here that there are, it's not just letters. You can see here, like, you have this nicely rounded 
corner, right? Like, that's a character. Like, these ones, like, it's fancy, double arrow, that's a character. Here, oh, okay, if, if, if I had to realize when I made this picture, you see, like, a car, so there's, like, a car. So, so yes, yeah, so there are lots of characters that are, like, cool for writing games like this, but, but yeah. Okay, and then, so what was, like, the big game that I made, and also why is it all called Adventures in Counter-Defense? So I took this Hungarian text adventure game from 88, that was written for the Commodore 64. And I knew everything about this game because like ages ago, I reverse engineered it, I remade it for Android. I, I, I like this, you know, I had the I, I had the technology, I should remake this. Um and it's it's the interesting part about this game is it's quite a modern design because the game script is stored in like the simple bytecode format, and most of the, the game is just an interpreter for these scripts. So instead of which was, you know, like, for example, this guy's previous game used the built in basic to implement the actual game logic, but it's a bit of a mess. But this one is like really elegant. It's all all in memory, so you load the game once, and the, the, the graphics and the text and everything is, is inside 64K. So, so if you write the new interpreter in for the Z80 for the same bytecode, then we should be done, right? The problem is that, like I said, it was written for the Commodore 64. So if you write the Z80 interpreter, then that takes care of the Commodore part, but not the 64 part, because I've heard the 64 in Commodore 64 stands for 64 kilobytes. First, we have 16 kilobytes. So, and you might think that if you just throw away the graphics, which you have to anyway, because text on, yeah, then it's gonna be, it's gonna fit, because of course these days we're used to multimedia being the big thing that takes up all the disk space or the memory space. Yeah. But turns out that even without the graphics, just the text messages and all the assets, that's still like 26 kilobytes. And then we haven't even done the interpreter yet, which came out to like one and a half K. So, so what did I end up doing? So first of all, I, I used CSKI from the from Infocom for the text representation that allows you to store three characters in two bytes. And then the other, and, and basically using that and fiddling a bit with the byte format, I was able to get it down to I think 20 K. Which is of course the order like maybe 18 plus two for the game itself, which of course still doesn't fit. So what I ended up doing is putting the game into two episodes. And that should, you know, you would think that okay, well, even with the naive encoding, if it's like 26k, you split it in half, now it's 13k half, right? That's not how it works. First of all, because the game itself, it's like a, you go some so, okay, so the game. Does anyone care? Is, is anyone interested in what the game is about? Because it's like okay, so the game is like this, this guy in uh, in rural uh, feudal Japan is out to like bring water to the village and arrives home to his family. Uh, sorry, the, the, the entire village being like burned and raised. So he goes on a revenge, right? That's why his name is the revenge. And so you eventually end up getting to China. And then you train to be a badass Kutsu master, and then you go back to Japan to kick the ass of the, the, the evil like warlord who raised the, the village because they did not think like taxes or ransom or whatever. So, but the problem with this story is that it's like, okay, you start in your village, you go somewhere to get trained, and then you come back. So the locations of the game, you can't really like cut it into half because the first half of the game is basically you know, solving all the puzzles that are needed to get to China to get to this Kung Fu master guy and get him to train you. But then you basically retrace your steps and now you can kick the ass of all those NPCs who will have... But it's actually a clear cut. It is a clear cut in terms of... Exactly. So, na so narratively, there's a clean cut, which is, okay, you get trained. Like that's, that's the halfway point, even in the, like in the original game, if you just look at how long it takes, like how many commands or how many percentage of scores you get, it's a very nice halfway point, a narrative bit satisfying, because episode one ends with you getting trained. The problem is that technically, because you go, like you kind of traverse the same terrain, so, so it's like the same room, so you don't get to throw away half the rooms if you just go there and not come back. And so, so there was quite some pruning needed to, to be done to, so but, but basically it turned out that A, of course there are parts of the Japan setting that you can't get to before you can defeat some of these guys and you can only defeat them if you're going to train. So you can cut down parts of the mansion of the evil warlord. And the other one was getting rid of uh, this section. So, so this is like a map of all the groups, right? So this one is like an annoying maze. I don't know if you guys have played any of these eighties sections. If you're going to the maze is very stable on these games, but they're really not fun. They're just there to waste your time. And I think there was another one here. No, 
know, I think there's a name for the here. Anyway, so there were two mazes I picked up. up. And then, uh, so the results, I give you the screenshot of this running on the home left too. Um, so the finishing touches included making sure that the plot works, make sure that the game works, that the puzzles work. So I ended up writing yet another interpreter in Haskell just so I could play the game to make sure that it's winnable in this trimmed script, which was actually really useful too, because I found that there were two puzzles in the game that depended on the graphics. So of course those have to be changed a bit because you don't have graphics, you can't see the picture, you don't get the hint from the picture. And then I also came up with this idea that I could just pre-compute the word graphics because every message is always printed starting at the first column. So you don't need to you know, have, put any code into your interpreter to word wrap. You can just compute it ahead of time and then you just put new lines. Yeah, you burn the new lines into the text of your story. You just replace some spaces with new lines. Sorry? Sorry, but the new lines are for free because you replace some spaces with like one yeah, space yeah. becomes one new line. <laughs> <It's kind of laughs> right? And also like in this particular screenshot, you can see that this word ends on the last column, and this word starts at the first. So here we were actually able to save a space. <laughs> because, <laughs> right? And and this matters because the final version had around 40 or less than 50 bytes of memory remaining, <laughs> but you need that for the stack. <laughs> so now this is a bit of an exaggeration because I could have saved another uh, 256 bytes by not implementing saving, quick saving, quick loading. So there's like a memory uh, saving and loading, but it's very nice to have because the game can be quite punishing in terms of like, you know, it can be quite detailed, so I really wanted to include that. So I thought, okay, right. I, I, that was always part of the calculation that we should have both the game state and the save game state in memory. Uh, yeah, official results. So it came out four out of thirteen entries. The first game, like the the, the, the game that actually won, was like, like untouchable because like I don't know who that guy is, but you know everything else on that we made like graphical game that has like smooth scrolling and like oh it's, it's amazing so there is absolutely no way to win the competition once that actually was made for it yeah i did a free person to be there but after the that after the cutoff for the official voting uh revenge has been slowly creeping up and now it's at second place i think what happened is that people have been playing it and discovering oh actually there's quite a lot of that like this is a long game like how does this even fit into this machine and then i guess they, they, they're voting for it so so that's it. And then, yeah, I got a bunch of links. So, so Snake and Home Lab 2048 are already open source. The, the open source release of the revenge is coming soon. It's just a bit of cleaning up. And, but what's also nice about it is that it, it's not just the game. It also includes all the tools that you can use to manipulate the bytecode. So you can even make your own game with the same entity if you want to. Why would you want to? And then I have a bunch of blog posts about this. Uh, for a retro challenge, which is like this one month block writing thing where you do something retro computing related. And it was happened to be just in October and the, the contest ended in the middle of October. So it's perfect time to like double it. And yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, if anyone's still interested, I also have one very cool story about the last minute, how I almost got screwed over in the very last minute by not being able to go to my game. Do we have time for that still? Or? I think it's neat. We're kind of running out of time. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. okay. Talk to me after. Or uh, the next cycle. Right. Uh, actually, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, okay, then that's pretty much it. So, Home Lab 2, it's a fun, eight bit home computer, quirky, we can make it for you. Yeah.